Good evening. Welcome out to the Sunday night here at Grace Baptist. Let's stand up and sing. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. If you are, would you say amen? Let's sing together. I'm so glad. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Well, I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join us with Jesus as we travel this on. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. Know my name is in the book of life is a song we're going to be singing. I don't believe it's in your hymnal this evening. Just look to the screens. Lift up your voices in song to the Lord. Every voice together, right? Like a big choir. Can we do that tonight? And let's sing to the Lord. I know my name is there. Lift it up. Good and loud on the first with me. My name is in the book of life. Oh, bless the name of Jesus. I rise above all doubt and strife and read my title clear. I know, I truly know, my name is there. I know, I know, my name is written there. My name once stood with sinners lost and bore a painful record. But by his blood the Savior crossed and placed it on his roll. I know, I truly know, my name is there. I know, I know, my name is written there. Yet inward troubles often cast a shadow o'er my title. But now with full salvation blessed, praise God, it's ever clear. I know, I truly know, my name is there. I know, I know, my name is written there. While others climb through worldly strife to carve a name of honor, high up in heaven's book of life, my name is written there. I know, I truly know, my name is there. I know, I know, my name is written there. Page 838, just over in the glory, glory land. It's not in your hymnals, but it'll be on the screens. Lift it up with me on the first. I have a home prepared. I have a home prepared where the saints abide, just over in the glory land. And I long to be by my Savior's side, just over in the glory land. Just over in the glory land I'll join the happy angel band. Just over in the glory land, just over in the glory land. The mighty angel, just over in the glory land. I am on my way to those mansions fair, just over in the glory land. There to sing God's praise and his glory share, just over in the glory land. Just over in the glory land I'll join the happy angel band, just over in the glory land. Just over in the glory land, there with the mighty host I'll stand. Just over in the glory land, with the blood washed throng, I will shout and sing. Just over in the glory land, glad hosannas to Christ the Lord and King. Just over in the glory land. Just over in the glory land, I'll join the happy angel band. Just over in the glory land, just over in the glory band, there with 
the mighty hosts all stand just over in the glory land. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me save that thou art. Thou my best thought by day or by night, walking, waking or sleeping, thy presence, my light. Think about these words, lift it up with me on the first this evening as we sing together. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought, by day or by night, waking or sleeping, thy presence my light. Be thou my wisdom and thou my true word, I ever with thee and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father and I thy true Son, Thou in me dwelling, and I with thee one. Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise, Thou my inheritance, now and always. Thou and Thou own the first in my heart. I, King of heaven, my treasure Thou art. I, King of heaven, my victory. Heaven's joys, a bright heaven sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler of all. Amen. That's a good prayer for us just to open up with this evening. Brother Tom, would you? Lead us in a prayer, just asking the Lord to be fill our vision. Amen. Amen. Let's be seated. And uh, tonight we're going to be having a prayer letter. I believe Miss Mary Adika is going to be reading that for us this evening from the Overtons. And if you'd come up and be ready for that, I'd also like the children to prepare for a spotlight. And I need you to go over and see Miss Rebecca. She has something for you. So if you'll just kind of scoot around the back side of the auditorium and go over by Miss Rebecca, sit down over there. Miss Mary, why don't you come on up and read from the Overtons and let us know how that they're doing. Thank you. Good evening, church. Good evening. Okay, uh, this is our letter that was uh, done in March 2022, and I'll be reading it in May. Okay, um, the Overton update. That the living word may be written in all languages. As you know, the Overtones are our missionaries to the worldview, 
and currently they have gone back to India. Yeah, I begin. Psalm 26, verses 1 to 4, begin with such a daily reminder of how we should be. Every day, Lord, I will trust, examine, prove, and remember thy loving kindness. However, verse 4 has been what I've been praying for our new students, and that is, I have not sat with vain person, persons, neither will I go in with dissemblers. We are fervent, fervently praying for this new batch of students to be sincerely godly to their very true call. Even myself, I hate my humanity and long daily to run, run, run to Christ to be made whole. I am very aware that even in Jesus' 12, there was one that proved unfaithful. We often think of a small group of students as these 12. And although we cannot see their thoughts or intents, we know that God, who can deliver, a, deliver into our Bible translations classrooms faithful students. Since arriving in India, we have been immersed in ministry, and it has been such a joyous time. I have had the privilege of preaching and playing the, my trumpet. Tori is discipling some uh, teen girls and playing the piano for the church. And Glory is catching up with all her friends and singing solos and in choir. However, our most important aspect has been to interview the new students for our June 20, 2022 beginning of the school year. We have had three in-person interview with what seem to be ministry, excuse me, minded students and we have had three others to be interviewed over social media. Also, because of the pandemic, we have had three students who have not graduated as yet and might be coming back to finish. Every year, there are many surprises of students who join us right at the last minute. Therefore, even though we are praying and interviewing and trying to meet everyone in advance, we'll have the very exact group that God has prepared for us in June when the classes begin. Some of our, of our very godliest students have been non-interview students. I've also had the joy of continued work with the Lukonzo translation team in Kasese, Uganda. It is such a privilege for me to be part of this great work that Brother Stensas is leading in Uganda, which leads me to one of the most blessed prospects of this coming school year. For a long while, the Tikir people in Nagaland have wanted to become an identified tribe. And in the last few months, this dream has become a reality. Along with their distinction, this people group have no Bible. For the past year or more, the campus church here in India have been praying that the Tikir people would receive the Bible in their heart language. Two Tikir speaking students are on campus now and both of them have such a heart to see the Bible translated into their language. One of the young men, Awong, plans to take our course the next two years with hopes that God will use him on the translation team. There's so much to pray for about the Tikir Bible. Many times, even though Bible translation is a small sphere, the communication is poor between our different groups, meaning that some linguists and translators are already doing the work on a language, but the tribe over on the next mountain do not know that this work is being done. Please pray for the Tiki translation project. We would love to be part of it from beginning to end, or at least contribute to the course if another group is already working on it. Pray that God would open doors, open communication between translator groups, and that he would allow a Wong to be part of the amazing work. Okay, it says, I'm attaching photos of our time here in this last month. And then it says, to God be the glory. And amen. amen. Thank you for that. And uh, I'm super grateful that they're back over there. And what a blessing that is uh, after it's been shut down for so long over there. But praise the Lord, that work continues on of uh, translating the Bible there. Praise the Lord. All right, children, why don't you come on up?
here. All right, can you can you line up here? All right, you guys vying for the first spot here? Is that what's going on? Is that what's going on? We're going to all be, why don't we move down there? We'll help you out here. We'll move all the way down there. And uh, how about that? There it goes. <coughs> that way we spread out across the platform. Okay, here's what we're doing tonight. We're giving our name, right? Saying a verse as, as typical, if you have a verse tonight. And then... Uh, then I'd like to sh uh, you to share something about your mom, all right? You all have cards there, and so you have a word there, and if you'd like to, what I'd like for you to think about is, is there a story, something special that you've done with your mom or your mom's done for you that you'd like to add to that, okay? And uh, you can't all say the same thing, like she took me out for ice cream or she got me ice cream. You can't all say the same thing. You gotta try to be original, so we'll pause and just take some time here, all right? So, Miss Sierra, can you start? Um, my name is Sierra, and my verse is being kind one to another. Amen. I was agreeing with you. <laughs> That's something that we need to remember. Amen. All right. Amen just means so be it. All right. What's your word for, for mom? Um. Can you show everyone? It's upside down. Beautiful. Okay. Now, do you have do you have something that mommy's done special for you that you want to share? Yeah. This is where it gets scary. All right. Um. My name is Cyrus, and on my card is loving. And my thing that my mom did to me is that she she is always loving. Very, very good. Good job. Um, my name is Savannah. Okay. <laughs> it should be. Okay. Say be kind one to another. Be kind one. Amen. Amen. <laughs> We're having a good time tonight. All right, what's your word? Um, helpful. Does mommy help you? Mom helps me. Yeah. And mom is beautiful. You can say that. My mom is beautiful. My, my name is Jason, and my verse is... We are more than conquered through him that loved us. Romans 8, 37. And amazing. <laughs> my name is Reed, and my rules is John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not pass, but have everlasting life. And mine says... Beautiful. And the thing about my mom is she's kind. My name is Donovan. My voice is um John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life and uh, my thing is kind. I think that's what it was. And then. Hmm. My name is Misty, and my verse is James 4 7. Re submit yourselves, therefore, and resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And on my card says, amazing. And she's amazing because she takes us on awesome trips. My name is Sabrina, and my verse is Psalm 100. 
3. Know ye that the Lord, he is God, it is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pastures. And my card says, hardworking. My name is Landon, and my verse is Proverbs sixteen fifteen. Pride cometh before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. And my card says, selfless. And my mom is selfless because she does all the, all the work around the house. Okay, do you help her out around the house? That's good. That's very good. All right, so kids, as you've given some of these statements tonight, these were the words that you came up with. And um, is there any other things that you want to say about your mom tonight or um, maybe a lesson that she's taught you? I'm putting you on the spot. Anything else? All right. Well, we're grateful that you've shared this tonight, and uh, it's important to always honor mom, okay? And before we go down, um, we're going to pray for the offering. So why don't you hand in the cards so you can be ready to, uh, ready to go take up the offering. Now, the Bible says in Proverbs 31 and verse number 28, the Bible says, look up here, kids. The Bible talks about um, how that the children rise up and call their moms blessed. What does it mean to be blessed? Or blessed. It's kind of like the idea to honor her and to, uh, and so not just on Mother's Day do we need to honor her. What are some ways that you can honor? What are some ways that you can honor your mom? Go ahead. Obey. Think of uh, some ways that you can honor your mom. You can um, clean the r- some rooms or the house. So that honors moms? Moms like that? I don't hear any mom saying amen. <laughs> Do chores. Do chores? What kind of chores? I don't know. Happy. Oh, do it happily? Yeah? yeah? I, I'm Scooping sure they the like yard. that. Sweeping the yard? Scooping the yard. I was, I was going to say, I don't know what happens at your house, but we haven't started sweeping the yard. Um. Do it before she asks us. Have you heard that before? Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Moms are taking record right now. Um. How can you honor mom? Ask mom. How you can help. How you can help. That's good. Um, scooping up the yard. Scooping up the yard. No one wants to walk through an unscooped yard. <laughs> Emptying the dishwasher. Emptying the dishwasher. Now we're getting really practical. Anything else? Setting the table. Setting the table. Setting the table right. How she's taught. Oh, no one else. All right. How can you honor mommy? Mm. Cleaning up the grass. Well, that's probably not in your ballpark, but. (laughs) Well, and and these and many more. And so don't just make it a mom's Mother's Day thing, but all the time you're honoring your mom. And um, the Bible says, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. right. And then it says, say it with me all together. Honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land, right? And if you want to live a long life, uh, honor your parents, all right? Let's pray. Let's ask God's blessing on this offering tonight and uh, thank him for our moms. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for these children. I pray that you would help uh, each one to honor their, uh, their parents, their moms, especially today as we think of moms. And I pray that you bless this offering, continue to provide for uh, your church and for uh, work down in the children's wing. Uh, may it always exalt you in everything that we do, even in our building, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.
Amen, amen. What a good day this is to be singing. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. Brother Caleb's coming to lead us. Children, find your way to Brother Mike. Let's stand to our feet. What a day that will be. He is coming again, church. Amen. Amen. What a day that will be. Lift it up with me on the first. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come. No more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day, that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. Sing it out with me on the second. We'll go a cappella on the chorus. There'll be no sorrow there. No more burdens to bear, no more sickness, no pain, no more parting over there. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day, that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see and I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day, that will be. Page 570, be still my soul, the Lord is on thy side. Think about these words, lift it up with me as we sing together tonight. Be still my soul, the Lord is on thy side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Leave to thy God to order and provide. The last verse there, the hour is hastening on when we shall be forever with the Lord. Amen. Let's grab our Bibles and let's uh, turn to Titus chapter number two tonight. Uh, I want to say a couple of things as we uh, turn there this evening. Uh, if you are interested in going to Grenada or that's something that is on your heart, 
Uh, later on this fall, I encourage you to um, be getting your passports and getting that ready. We had a wonderful um, adventure camp uh, training meeting, equip meeting on Thursday night. Thank you to all that were uh, able to be there. If you did not get the booklet, uh, from that, they are out at the Welcome Center. Just ask the guys that are behind the desk. And so you need that. It has assignments in it and uh, information inside of it. So you need that. So I encourage you to pick that up. And uh, do pick up a sign, would you, and put it in your yard. doesn't matter if you're working in an adventure camp. If you could help us out, and if you know of a couple places they could go, uh, that would be a big help to us, uh, get those signs out in a, a way of advertising for adventure camp. We believe that God's going to save souls there, right? All right, let's help spread the word for that and uh, looking forward to what the Lord is going to do in that, uh, in that time. Uh, Titus chapter number uh, 3, coming into this final stretch of Titus, verses 1 through 7. Titus chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Paul exhorting uh, Titus to do this, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers and obey magistrates to be ready to every good work. To speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. And that'd be a really great place for just an amen, right? Uh, that is a special, special verse. But after the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but by his, according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly, this mercy shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And you may be seated. Father, would you guide us in your word tonight? This is your truth, and we want to understand it. We want to make it plain and Lord, we pray that you would just illumine it by your Holy Spirit. I thank you for the ministry of your Holy Spirit, even as we read just there, how he is working in us at the moment of salvation. Uh, it is the washing, the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. What a miracle that took place the day that we got saved. Lord, I pray that we not get over that, that you would warm our hearts with that as we meditate on it this evening. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So here we are coming into this final stretch of, of Titus, this last chapter, a very short, brief letter that he's writing to his son in the faith, Tim, on Titus, uh, another preacher boy, someone that uh, Paul had led to the Lord and uh, was on his heart just to, uh, to communicate vital truth, to help him there in Crete to establish and to, uh, to build up healthy churches. If you notice in chapter 1 and verse number 4, to Titus, mine own son after the common faith. He had led him to the Lord. He had uh, no doubt discipled him and overseen uh, that. And at this point, he is encouraging him there as he left him in Crete. Verse number five, for this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou should have set in order the things that are wanting, the things that are lacking there, the things that are out of order. And, uh, and, and first of all, ordain elders in every city as I appointed thee. And he goes on to talk about how those elders ought to, uh, how they ought to be qualified, uh, how he ought to deal with those that are unruly. He goes on to deal with how, uh, how to, preach sound doctrine, but also to apply sound doctrine in chapter number two, which we finished up last week. But I want us to especially note here, as, as Paul is encouraging Titus how to help this church be healthy there on the island of Crete, no doubt there's, there's different meetings or assemblies, different churches, local churches throughout the island. How does he help these churches to be healthy churches and really to exemplify the Lord Jesus Christ, to, to be visible in the community, not to be backward in the community, not to be isolated, but to be visible in the community and really to be uh, uh, a church that is healthy and exalting the Lord Jesus Christ. How is he going to help them to do that? He says here, I want you to put some things in their mind. I want you to remind them of some things. And how often do we need to be reminded of things that we've learned before? 
uh, over and over and over again. It's amazing how short-term our memory is and how much is in our minds. I mean, there's so much that, that is in our minds, and it seems like you, you, uh, it, it is crowded out. You know, things that we learn on Sunday is crowded out as we get into work and get into the life on Monday. But we're to be reminded, and he says, uh, Tim, uh, Titus, I, I want you to put them in mind. I want uh, you to put this in their minds. I want you to remind them and I want you to do this over and over. And what is a healthy church going to be reminded of here? What is a healthy church going to be remembering? And I want us to notice how he deals with this. First of all, put them in mind and read with me to be subject to principalities and powers. Once again, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers. So he's going to deal with their life in the public arena. Now, I think this is fabulous how the Lord has helped us out tonight and brought us to this passage. One of the reasons I like preaching through is, is the Lord seems to select the passages for what we need when we need it. And I don't know about you, but there's a, there's a, a growing sense in our, our world. We all sense this, the, the growing evil around us and, and dealing with the, the feeling of how do I obey in this society? How do I uh, remain subject in this society? And and Paul is encouraging Titus to help the church there at Crete uh, how to order their life in the public arena, in the city life, in the, in the community, in, uh, to the magistrates, to the mayor, and, and to the police chief, and, and, and to those that are leading in the, in the city. How do they order their life? What does Christ want his body to do in relation? How does he want his body to interact with the public arena? How does he want his body to interact with the ungodly? Because sometimes we're dealing with people that are just so ungodly and, they're, and they're, their thinking is twisted and, and inside you just want to be mad at them. You want to be angry towards them. But is that the way that Jesus wants us to respond to the public arena, to our culture? Is that how he wants us to respond? Well, first of all, he says here, I want you to be submissive. I want you to remember to be submissive. Now, there's a lot more study that, that could be done and, and discussion that could be done on this uh, on this topic right here but he says to them i want you to put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers and obey magistrates or what does that mean he says i want you to be willing to obey the idea of subject is to be submissive it is to be inclined that way to be willing that way really we're talking about an attitude here that is that, that is looking for a way to submit looking for a way to be submissive looking for a way to demonstrate that type of attitude. I, I, I want to obey. Uh, is there a way that I can obey God and obey this individual? I want to do it. And so he says, I want you to be subject and I want you to obey. I want you simply to follow the orders. Now, we pay our taxes, right? Like it or not, right? Um, here we go. God told us that we are to be remembering as a healthy church to obey in that way. Uh, as painful as it might be sometimes, uh, we obey laws that come down. Sometimes a, a law really bothers us. We don't like it. But a, a, a healthy church, a healthy Christian is looking for the way to be submitting in, in those ways. Now, I do want to just draw this out here because we live in a in a day and as i mentioned this morning uh, our our nation is different than even what they were under uh they were under uh, many of them uh, 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 the rule of a caesar the rule of a a dictator the rule of an absolute ruler you and i are privileged to live in a country that was founded on we the people i don't know if you count that a privilege but i certainly count that as a privilege now how does that relate? We are the ones that elect our, our or put in place our government. Now, as, as we say this, we have a duty to, to, uh, a duty to respond with a submissive attitude to those we have elected in place. Now, we see as our nation is moving further and further away from God that the, the, those being elected are reflecting the, the spiritual temperature of our nation, the spiritual temperature of our culture, and so it, we're finding it is going to be harder and harder to obey God and obey them. 
But he says, I want you to have a, a spirit, an attitude of, of submission, an inclination that I want to obey. What, wh- how, does this, how does this work in our life? You've been around a person that goes, uh, no one's going to tell me what to do. That is not the spirit that God wants us to have. That is not the spirit that the body of Christ is to have. A healthy church is not, not going to tell me what to do. I don't care what anyone tells me to do. We're not following that crazy law. Uh, we have to get the buses inspected. Well, that's just them dominating us. No one's going to tell us what to do. No, we're going to get the buses inspected. Thank you, Brother Frank. All the work, and, and the others that have helped out, uh, out with that, all the work that goes into that. Why? Because we live in a, in a state with that law, and we're going to obey. Uh, it's not the idea of no one's going to tell me what to do. So there's, a, there's an attitude that, that God wants us to have as a healthy church. Now, I will say this, and this is important for us to understand. In the last couple of years, we have seen, we have seen those in elected office violate our own laws. And so we have a situation where there are sometimes laws that were on the book and yet mandates that were being handed down that were, were against the laws. And there is a, a proper attitude to deal with that. And I, I thank the Lord for our, our church. Even as we met during, uh, during 2020, there were things that we were doing that, that did not obey mandates. We obeyed laws, but we did not obey mandates because, because they, they were violating of a, of a law. But still, the spirit in which we were was not, no one's going to tell us what to do. The spirit is, we, we want to obey and, and do the very best that we can. Um but where it comes in conflict with the law of God, we have to follow God. So when we talk about don't assemble, um, there comes a point, as Peter said, when we must obey God rather than men. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. The, the church is a called out assembly, and we are responsible to our Savior to assemble as his church. Uh, we hear things about church not being essential, and that, uh, and that didn't happen so much in this state, but we, we heard that uh, in our country, and the fact is the Bible says the church is the, the pillar and the ground of truth in a society, and yet there's government officials that said no, and, and so balancing this out, he says to have an attitude that is bent towards, inclined towards, I want to obey. I, I want to submit in that way. And friends, if we have that attitude, that is the attitude of, of Christ. I want to submit. What was it when Peter came to them? Oh, should, we be, oh, should we obey taxes when the Pharisees came to him? Render unto Caesars that which is Caesar and unto God's that which is God. Uh, do what, what you are responsible to do. Uh, do what is required of you in that, in that way. We think, uh, think of uh, even over the last couple of years, wear this, take this, this shot, I'm not getting into telling you um, one way or the other on that, that's between you and God. Uh, offer your employees, business, Christian business owners, offer your employees access to abortion and, and so on. Uh, these, are, these are things that begin to deal with violating, violating, uh, especially that last one I mentioned, violating uh, God's law. So how do you balance that? Friends, what I want us to understand is he's saying, I want you to have an inclination, a, a, a spirit of submission. But there is a sense, there is a real duty that we have by the Holy Spirit's power to discern. Is this something that violates a higher law, which is God's law? But even when it does, our attitude is, well, God said this and you can't tell me what to do. It's not a cocky attitude. And uh, one of the, someone asked me early on, uh, one of our former church members, how do you keep a good spirit? Um, how do you keep a good spirit in the midst of all this? How do you keep a good attitude in the midst of all this? And what the Lord gave me was this. If, if, if we are more about obeying Jesus Christ, if, our, if we're submitted to Jesus Christ, and our eyes are following him, it's not all about what we're against, it's what, who we're for. That makes a huge difference. And there are sometimes Christians get all about we're against that person and that person and that government official and that place and, and, that, and that movement, and we forget who we're for. And when we're for him, there are times where we're going to have to be against some things. Does that make sense? But the, if we're submitted to him, we'll have that submissive spirit towards, towards those that are ruling over us. 
And I do greatly value the fact that we live in a country that it, that it is we the people and the government is of the people and by the people and for the people. Uh, and we, we should take that responsibility uh, and that privilege very, very seriously. So this spirit of submission, this attitude of submission, and uh, every one of us is going to give an account to God in, in that way. We ought to have this attitude uh, of submission. Lord, I, I want to obey. Uh, we ought to have an attitude of submission towards the, uh, towards the police and towards our city and towards the, uh, towards the different ordinances within in our town. And there is a correct way to deal with it. In our country, thank the Lord, there's a correct way to deal with it, and it's at the ballot box. And, uh, and be involved and be engaged in that, in that way. And so uh, an attitude that is ready to submit. But also notice he says, and to be ready to every good work. Now, this is again, Jesus, via the apostle Paul, is pulling the church out of, out of a holy huddle and saying, hey, don't just say, hey, I'm over here and against this. Uh, have an attitude of submission, but also be ready. Be eager to every, every good work. And so the idea is, every morally excellent work. You ought to be excelling. You ought to be excelling in the, in the public arena in morally excellent work. Uh, be completely prepared for it. Uh, be ready to jump into action. What does that look like? That's a, an I can do that attitude. Just like we're, we're, uh, we're not to have this attitude and no one's going to tell me what to do. We're going to have an attitude of, you know what? I just want to submit where I can. I want to do right. I want to honor God. And I want to honor those that have been, uh, are in leadership over me. I want to honor them in that way. In the same way here, I can do that. Uh, how can I help? And sometimes, sometimes we can get so focused on our, what we're about that we forget that we live in a society we need to serve. We can certainly start by praying. We can certainly start by praying for those that are in leadership, those magistrates. Uh, do you know who your mayor is? Do you know who your representative is. How are they going to do the right thing? We pray. We pray this. Lord, give them wisdom. Give them wisdom. How are they going to have wisdom if they do not have believers speaking into their ears? We need to be ready to every good work. Uh, what I see here is, is Paul is, is, is challenging the Christian believers. We need to live practical doctrine, chapter number two. We need to apply it into our lives. We need to be living right according to sound doctrine. But then take that out into the public arena and make sure that you're living in a way where you are engaged and you're ready to every single good work, where we're advocating for the helpless, where we're serving, uh, even as God would move upon some of your hearts to serve in some sort of public office where you're serving the community. We're the pillar and the ground of truth. Listen, if we're not out there, we aren't, we aren't upholding the truth. We're not bringing the truth out there. And so how important it is to be ready to every good work, caring for the hurting. I, I was blessed by one of my pastor friends over in the Mount Vernon area. He, uh, he calls me up and says, hey, I, I, got, I got signed up to be a poll worker this year. And I, I texted him earlier this week. And he says, I said, how did it go? And he says, it went really great. And he wanted to be aware so he could lead his church in that way uh, and how to get involved in the August 2, uh, August 2 election and so on. Um, being ready to every good work. Uh, that was a good work. Why? Uh, there's a man, there's an individual who believes the truth, is governed by the truth, and as such, put himself in that place to stand up for truth, uh, to be a, a light for Jesus Christ, to stand up for truth. Um, be present. Uh, there's times, you know, we get, we get upset. Well, the city did this, and the city did that, and the mayor made that decision. Well, are you present? Are we present? Do you know, have you, have you connected with, with your representatives? Do you know them? And friends, how important it is to be ready for good work. Well, that's, that's for someone else to do. They're your representatives. And be ready to encourage them and pray with them. I think about this. We are on this day thinking about mothers. But you know, sometimes we, we say, well, there's so much abortion going on in our country. But you know, there's, a, there's an evangelical women's center in our in our city that could use maybe a lady to be there and say i could volunteer some hours to to counsel encourage and pray with to pray with some people that are going through a rough time that's what i'm talking about being ready to every good work being ready to serve 
being ready to encourage morally excellent work. God, like I said this morning, it isn't about a place filling up this, this room. It's about being out there. We're growing in here so we can go out there. And it's amazing the opportunities as we're willing to be ready for every good work. It's amazing the opportunities that God will give to us for the gospel's sake. It's amazing what God will do. And so let's not be known for, about, um, for what we're, we're against. Let's be known for what we're about, and that's every good work. We're for Jesus Christ. We want to be submissive to him and have a spirit of submission, and we're wanting to, to serve like Jesus did, to care for people like Jesus, uh, like Jesus did. And so we're to remember to be subject to authorities, but go on with me in verse number two, to speak evil of no man. And Paul's saying, hey, I want you to put them in remembrance of this. Uh, make sure that you have a right spirit, a godly spirit. And he says, speak evil of no man. What's the idea here? Make sure that your spirit is peaceable. Make sure that you have a, a peaceable spirit. The idea of speaking no, uh, evil of no man is the idea to stir up slander. Don't be the one that is slandering. You say, well, they, they deserve it. You know, it's really easy to look at our at our culture right now and to say some evil things and to, to carry on some things that you might not even know that's true and to allege some things about a person that you've never even met or you've not called or you've not prayed for. Are you with me? I saw them on, te on television and I heard, I heard this, this perspective about them and so here's what I, I believe. He says, speak evil of no man. Wow. That's pretty serious actually. Uh, again, what's the context here? Is this inside the church? Should we speak evil of one another? Yes or no? No. But what's the context here? It's outside the church. It's in the public arena. So what he's talking about is the people that you see out in town, the people that, that, that are working in your workplace, the people that are leading in the city and leading in the state. Speak evil of no man. Don't slander them. I want you to have a peaceable spirit. And you've been around the, the person that's always ready to give an opinion about everybody and to say, uh, say some really jarring things about, about folks. Uh, we're not to be like that. Jesus says, speak evil of no man. A healthy church is characterized by a graceful tongue, a, a peaceable tongue. But here he goes on, no brawler. The idea is this person isn't hostile and ready and looking for a fight, just you know, arms up and ready for a fight. Now, I will say this, it does seem that over the past couple of years that what has developed in our nation is a very vengeful fighting spirit. Do, do you feel that? Everyone's just ready and, and on their defenses. And some of that's because we, there was so much to defend, even as early on, early on 2020, uh, it, it, it was like, boy, you just kind of ha constantly had to be on guard against, uh, against what was out there. And I don't want to get sick, and I don't want to die. I don't wanna, you know, so there was constantly this, this defensive spirit, but that has gone into what, what seems to be a cultural attitude of just kind of a spirit of hostility. Friends, we must not be like that. No brawler. We're not looking for a fight. You could land a fight about anything right now. And friends, even on the matter of uh, the abortion and life issue, friends, we aren't to go to work tomorrow and be in the public square tomorrow and be looking for a fight. We can't do that. We have to go there with truth. And remember this, a soft answer turns away wrath. There are some really angry people right now. They're hurting they don't know better. They're blinded by the God of this world. And if we go to them with a spirit of hostility or a brawler spirit, a, a ready-to-fight spirit, but we're going to lose our opportunity. And so he says a healthy church is, is peaceable in their spirit. Their spirit is calm. You know, sometimes I think we, we think like it all depends on us to change other people. It doesn't. God does the changing. He does the work. We're just the agents. We're just the mouthpiece. And if we go with leaving it in his hands, it really would help us to have a, a, a very peace, um, peaceable spirit. Now, this was a qualification of the, of the bishop, the pastor. He's not to be a brawler. He's not to be one constantly looking for a fight. He's not to be in that, that fight mode, that host, uh, hostile mode. Uh, he wasn't to be like that. So that's the other time the word appears in the New Testament. Uh, don't be a brawler. All of us, God's saying all of us, encourage the church. By the way, if the pastor's a brawler, he's probably going to have a church that's a, um, a brawling church, a hostile church. And the opposite. So no wonder, God said one of the qualifications, I don't want my pastors to have that, that fighting spirit, that hostile spirit. 
God expects every believer not to be hostile. He expects every believer not to be fight ready. And I think that it just causes us to pause and say, you know, Lord, while the culture has gotten that in, the, in their system, would you purge me of that, that spirit in any way? Would you help me to engage people, everyone, store, work, park, everyone, with a peaceable spirit, not just ready for a fight? And everyone expects, expects that, and even sometimes how Christians are portrayed, uh, they, they'll expect that, that spirit. But if we have a peaceable spirit like our, our Savior did, well, what a difference that it will make. And that's a healthy believer. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men, Romans 12 and verse 18. As much as be possible. And let, us give the, let me just give a, a key, at least from my perspective, on what allows us to have a peaceable spirit. When we allow God to be the judge, and he is, right? When we allow God to be the judge of all things, and we leave the final determination up to him, I can rest that he has it. Genesis 18 and verse 25. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? What do you say? Yes? Yes? God, I'm going to turn this one over to you because if I hold on to this, it just makes me mad. And it riles up my spirit, and that's not a good representation of you. And so we turn it to him. But not just a peaceable spirit that we are to have and maintain, Notice here in verse number two, but gentle, showing meekness unto all men. Say that out loud, good and loud with me. But gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. Isn't it interesting? All and all. He really wants us to get this. The idea of of gentle is lenient. Now, God is not telling us to to condone sin or to overlook sin. It's not what he's telling us to do. But have a lenient attitude. Have a merciful attitude gentle attitude tolerant of the slight deviations uh is the idea so we're we're not we're not this letter of the law the super harsh individual kind of carries out of the no brawler we're we're gentle it's the opposite of a a brawler someone who is gentle they're they're lenient they they uh they have some room to give and obviously god's the one that's going to hold every single person uh in judgment and into account so, uh, and and uh, it's appointed unto men once to die, and after that, the judgment. And so we, he will sort it all out. But in our spirit towards people, there's sometimes that, that we will face things that are not right, and we need to have a gentle spirit. We need to have a gentle spirit. We don't come out and say, oh, it's okay, and, and condone it, but we have a gentle spirit, a, a spirit that is lenient, it's merciful, it, it has some tolerance to it. Now, God's wisdom, according to James 3, 17, is always peaceable, always peaceable. He says there, but wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. Do you see, sometimes you might get around some believers that are very, very letter of the law, and there's, there's, no, there's no wiggle room. And uh, they're, they're, so, they're so thrilled with their, their godly position. And we ought to take godly positions. But just understand this, that wisdom that's from above knows how to navigate through the different issues of life and to have a peaceable attitude, a gentle attitude, a, a merciful attitude. And may God help us. And how, how many of you disagree with me? That's, that's a learning process. That's a learning process. Because sometimes we're confronted with things in our culture and even in our own families, sometimes we're confronted with things that are just, that, are, that, that cause us to struggle. And how we need to have that gentle, gentle spirit. Now, he goes on to say all meekness. Not just some meekness, all meekness. What is that? It's gentleness again. So we, uh, we're just, we're, we're again, it's like, like Paul is just landing on, I want you as a church. If you're going to be healthy as a church... If you're going to have a healthy testimony for Jesus Christ, be a healthy representation of the, the Lord Jesus Christ in the community, you need gentleness. You need gentleness. There, there just needs to be a, a mild, even-tempered manner to you. That needs to be your, your spirit. So um, meekness is the idea of strength under control. I'm not coming in and just crushing it. I'm not going to just lamb blast them. I can think in the past, especially early on, I'm, I'm thinking back um, more than 10 years ago, I the Lord taught me and, and um, my wife a, a lesson in, in discipleship, and uh, we had, we had uh, been discipling somebody along, and, 
and, uh, and really we were, we were pretty fresh and we wanted to uh, help them along and they were asking questions and I did not remember the lesson that the Lord Jesus or the words that the Lord Jesus used, which was, um, there are many things that I have to say to you, but you're not ready for them now. Rather, uh, just dumped it all out and crushed them. And I'll never forget that in having a conversation later, and I praise the Lord uh, that the Lord uh, helped overcome that. But never forget later just uh, sensing, you know, it's not always right to just to pour it all out. You get to work and you just lamb blast the person that curses God's name. You know, it's like a badge of, you know, you know, a badge of honor. You know, I, I told them what? No, God wants us to be mild. He wants us to be even-tempered. He wants us to stand for righteousness, yes, but they ought to be done out of a heart of meekness. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy in balance with your vocation, in balance with, with the salvation that Jesus Christ has given you. Uh, he says, with all lowliness and meekness, Ephesians 4.2, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, with all meekness, strength under control. I heard them curse, and so I told them, Strength under control. Uh, who did Jesus show anger to? Help me out here tonight. Who did Jesus show anger towards? Okay, the Pharisees, the, the whole temple money exchange. Um, can you help me? And, and let's turn over to John chapter 8 and verse number 10. John 8 and verse number 10. And as you're turning there, I want to remind you of another passage of Scripture. Turn to John 8 and verse number 10. Matthew 9 and verse 36 says, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. Well, hold up. They had entrusted him yet, and they were sinners. Uh, but he was moved with compassion because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. He looked at the multitudes that were, that were going about their daily life and going about their life as sinners and going on their way legitimately, the broad way that leads to destruction, and they're going about their life, and inside of Christ was not, well, they're going to meet their, they're going to meet their maker at the end of their day, and they're going to, to, they're going to face eternal judgment, and you're going to go on your way to uh, destruction. No, it was moved with compassion. That was a spirit. It was gentle. Are you there at John 8 and verse 10? You all there? When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, woman, let's pause, who's this lady? Do you remember? The lady caught in adultery. And the Pharisees thought they were somebody because they come and they say, we caught her in the very act. Quite a statement. And they were expecting Jesus to come down and crush her good. And to compliment, to compliment them. And so he says, he looks up, and after, what did he do? He, he knelt down and, and wrote in the sand, okay? You remember that, that whole scenario? Who knows what he wrote, but uh, we can only imagine what he wrote. Maybe it was a little bit uh, shameful for them. He looks up, he sees her, sees none but the woman, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, no man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Did he say, go on in your life? Just go back to doing what you're doing. No, he didn't say that. He says, neither do I condemn thee. What a gentle spirit. Go and sin no more. Uh, you need to change. You need to change course, but I don't condemn you. What a gentle, gentle spirit. That's the spirit that, that God wants his church to have. Remember, we are the living, breathing, visible representation of Christ in the earth. People don't know Christ face to face except for what they see in us. And so we're to have that same spirit. And sometimes you might feel like, boy, I'm, I'm walking a tightrope. How do I deal with this issue? It's, it's clearly wrong. Did you see what Jesus said? Neither will I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. He walked the tightrope. He dealt, with, he dealt with his love. I don't condemn you, but his holiness. Don't go on in your sin. Don't go on in your sin. Christ's church should possess the same gentle spirit as Christ had. 
Not a well I told you so attitude. No. Same gentle spirit. Now, I don't know about you, but that, that requires the help of the Holy Spirit, doesn't it? Sure does. But it also requires something else. And I marvel at the power of the Word of God. Because he could leave there. I don't want you to, I want you to be a brawler. I want you to be peaceable and gentle and have meekness. I, I want you to have a life that, that, uh, that is that way. I want you to have that type of spirit. He could have left it there, but he didn't. He goes on in verse number three. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish. Uh-oh. Do you know what God did? He just turned the tables. He said, hey, do you remember what you used to be? Oh, well, when you're talking like that. And we can get pretty, we can get pretty high on ourselves. We, we've come five years in the faith, 15 years, 10 years, whatever, whatever it is, 25, 30. And we can think, well, you know what? We're pretty good. Hold up. He says, there was a time in your life when you were just like them. All right, let's look at this. We need to remember where we started. As by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all had sinned. There is not one sin in this world today that we, at least we're not capable of committing, or even some of the sins that we see prevalent did not commit. And just understand this, he saved us out of that lifestyle. Now think about this, verse 3, for we ourselves, for we ourselves were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice, even, uh, envy, hateful, hating one another. And I want us just to catch this. He says, but after that, the kindness and love. And just understand that, that what God is saying to us, remember where you started, we at one point needed his. We needed his uh, gentleness in our lives. And exactly what he says there in verse number four, he says, uh, it was after the kindness and the love of God, it was portrayed to you. Uh, there was a time where you were in need, just like they're in need, just like your coworkers in need, just like your lost family members in need. There was a time you were in need. There was a time you served the different lusts, the different desires that you had. There was a time you lived in constant angst and malice and that you were envious of, the, uh, of everyone else's stuff and that you were hateful. There was a time when that was true of your life, when you were foolish, not walking according to the wisdom of the Lord. Turn over to 1 Corinthians 6 and verse number 9. There was a time when you served you're lost and you lived in malice. There was a time. It does us well to remember back to what we were before Jesus stepped in. It does us very well. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 9. Let's all turn there together. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse number 9. It says this. Know ye not. Remember, to whom are we writing? The Corinthians. Is that a pretty wicked city? Yes. There were some believers that held on to some of their their issues and even got upset at one another for some of the issues yes there was division there know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of god well that's we understand that right the unrighteous those that have not been washed by the blood of the lamb those that have not been made righteous by christ will not inherit the kingdom of god right okay we understand that be not deceived neither fornicators nor idolaters nor adulterers nor the effeminate nor abusers of themselves with mankind. And there we're dealing with all sorts of the, the, the homosexuality, especially in those last, uh, last couple words, but we're dealing with the, uh, the, the sins of immorality. He goes on, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. All right, this is, this is like reading the newspaper. It's everywhere. It's prevalent. Wouldn't you agree? all over, all right? 
So they're under the condemnation of God for these. Those that live in this, this habitual sin, they, this is their way of life. As, as 1 John talks about, uh, they, this, is their, their, this is their whole frame of thinking. This is their characteristic. This is how they go about life. He says in verse number 11, and such were some of you. Say that out loud with me. And such were some of you. What is God constantly doing here in Titus and also in Corinthians? He's reminding us we were once there too. Well, hold up. I was saved as a, I was saved as a, a youngster. You had the capacity for every single one of those sins. And your sin, the sin of disobedience, is as grievous to God as any other sin. And it was a sin of disobedience in the garden, right? That plunged the whole human race into, into, uh, into sin. And so how, how important it is to realize, and such were some of you. There was a day that you needed the gentleness of God. You needed God to be gentle towards your sin. Uh, God should have just X'd us, got us out of this world, killed us, put us in hell. I mean, that's what we deserve, but he didn't do that. We experienced the gentleness of God. And he says there in verse um, 4, after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward men appeared. So after that point, after God showed up in our lives, after he showed up with his gentleness, the idea of kindness is that warm-hearted, gentle, humane, sympathetic, isn't that our God? Not condoning sin, but that is his heart. Warm-hearted, that's who he is. And the love for humanity, interesting about this love, this word for love here is the idea of philanthropy. It's looking at, at a human condition that is, that is suffering and saying, I want to help. And that was God when he looked down in the, on the human race suffering in our sin. I want to help. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that is the kindness, the response to our suffering and our sin that God had towards us. There was a day I needed that. And there's, honestly, I'm so grateful that I'm still in need of the gentleness and the the kindness of our, our Lord today. How good he is to show that. There's another time this word kindness shows up. This word, this idea of love shows up in the Bible, Acts 28 and verse 2, when, uh, when, when Paul was shipwrecked and they were on that, the island of Malta and you remember they were cold, it was, it was not good weather and they started a fire and the barbarous people showed no little kindness for they kindled a fire and received us every one. No little kindness. The idea, they looked on their plight as shipwrecked individuals and they said, we want to help. Aren't you thankful that that's our God? He looked at you, sick with sin. I want to help you. I want to help you. That's the heart of God towards the sinner. I want to help you. And what gentleness God displays for us. And, and so really the question is, how could we not be gentle to other sinners when God was gentle to us as a sinner? How could we not show gentleness to our coworker when God has already showed gentleness to us? That's what God wants in his church. That's what makes us a healthy church. But go on, verses 5 through 7, we once needed his mercy as well. In that famous verse, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. The leniency is the word here, the compassion shown towards an uh, offender um, by a, an agency of authority. Uh, he showed us this compassion, this leniency. He did not condone sin. He did not let sin go. He did not overlook sin, but he showed mercy. He did not give us on what we deserved. And how was this done? Which was shed. This mercy was shed abroad, verse number six. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior, we are justified by his work at the cross. The mercy was poured out at the place of the cross for you and for me. And so he justifies us. He makes us heirs of eternal life. Think about that. He makes us heirs of eternal life. Now that's amazing. When God grafted us into his family on through Jesus Christ, and he, he said, all that Jesus has in me, you have in me now by faith. You talk about you talk about mercy. You talk about good news. Right there it is. God who is rich in mercy for his great love with where he loved us. And so how could we be hostile to a sinning world, a, a world that's violating God's laws and is running away from um, God and is cursing God? How could we be hostile to them when God 
showed us mercy when we are in that exact same position. How can we be hostile? How can we not have the spirit of mercy? I want you to turn to Luke 9 and verse number 51. All this is about how we are interacting in the public arena. How we are, how we are interacting with the people we work with and the people that we know and the ungodly. How we're interacting with them. Luke 9 and verse number 51. Once you're there, would you say amen? All right, Luke 9, verse 51. And it came to pass, when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly went and, or set his face to, on to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of Samaritans, of the Samaritans, to make ready for him. And they received him not. How many of you like to be rejected? Anyone here? No. Jesus was rejected. They received him not because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? There's the spirit. That's how we deal with the ungodly. That's how we deal with those that reject Jesus. That's how we deal with the, those that are, are uh, advocating for the, the murder of babies. That's how we deal with them. Just call down fire from heaven and deal with them. Hmm. But he turned and rebuked them. You know what comes to mind right now? Is homosexuality wrong? Yes. Is the way to deal with homosexuality to go picket in front of pride parades and tell them they're, and hold up banners and say you're going to hell and um, write hateful things? You know, I'm, I'm a Baptist by, by choice, by conviction. I believe they're biblical distinctives. But you know, there's, there's some even that are in, that call themselves Baptists that are like James and John who will go and do things that hurt the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. Show up and protest at soldiers' funerals and call them all sorts of names. I think you're, you're aware enough. I don't want to give that, that name any, any more, uh, any more uh, popularity, but that couldn't be further from the heart of Jesus Christ. I know right now of, of, of Baptist churches in our state that right now have on their websites as a homosexual, you are not allowed in our church. And such were some of you. And such were some of you. Now, granted, there, is, there are those that, that mean uh, harm against the, the people of God. I understand that. That's another story. But those that, where are they going to come? If they can't come in contact with us and find a gentle spirit, and find direction out of the mess and the shackles of sin, where can they go? Can they go to a counselor? Can they go to the government? Can they call some hotline? Where are they going to be able to go? If they can't come to the church, where are they going to go? And so he says, he turns to them and he rebukes them, and then notice what he says, ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. Whoa. Whoa. We're on your side. We're standing up for truth. We're standing up against those that are rejecting you. Yeah, we're doing the right thing. We, we have a good stand. We're, we're against what they've just done. You don't know the spirit that you're of. Hmm. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. But to save them. You know what Jesus did? He goes to another village. He goes to another village. He doesn't write about them in the paper. Doesn't get on the radio and share how hard and cold they were to him. He just goes to another village. And he goes where they're open. And friends, 
We need to have the heart of Christ as we interact with this godless world. Not the heart of James and John. Thankfully, John changed, right? He's called the disciple of love. Boy, he changed. How he changed. That was a work of God. What a blessed thing that is. And no doubt, it was John coming to realization of who he was before God once. And then the, the kindness and the love of Jesus Christ showing up in his life changed him so that now he could go and be kind and loving towards others. He could go and be gentle and merciful towards the lost that were still in need. And so I want us to end with this. You know, the way that you and I interact with a God-rejecting public arena, I'm talking about anything to do with just the world in which we live. The way that we interact, the way that we talk, the way that we carry ourselves, the attitude we carry there, indicates of how we view ourselves before God. If we, if we view ourselves, if we have arrived, we are, because we're saved, we're better than all of them, that I'm above them because I'm, you know, I'm a part of this church or I'm a, I, I, I've been saved and I, I don't live the way they do, I, I'm above them, we're going to interact with them with a spirit of hostility and arrogance. It's going to come off. But when I constantly realize that I once was just where they were and God showed the same mercy and kindness and gentleness to me, I can turn around and give that same mercy and gentleness to them. If I've grasped truly the amount of mercy and love that God has shown towards me, it's then I can give it to somebody else. But when we find ourselves getting harsh and so aggravated, and I, I get it, we live in this world, I get it, and I, I, believe, I believe those are emotions we deal with. I, I, I understand that. But if we'll stop and just consider, I was once where they are, and God loved me there. Friends, our world needs that right now really bad. It might seem like it's distant and it's happening in Washington and somewhere else other than here, but our world right here needs it very bad. There are people right within this, this plat that need that. There's people in your neighborhood that need your mercy. They need to sense the mercy and the gentleness of Christ expressed through your life. And we can get, we can get vengeful and we can get hostile. That's not what he wants. Put them in mind. Put them in mind of what? Make sure you're submissive in your spirit. Make sure you maintain the right spirit. Make sure that you are remembering where you started. And may God help us to go into the world this week with that. And that might, might cause you to just have to stop and, Lord, I, I really need your help because I struggle with that gentle spirit. And you know what? He'll help you. One more verse. Turn to Galatians. Because I want us to know where the help is. Galatians chapter number 5. Let's stand and read this together. Galatians chapter number 5. Now if you look at verses 19, 20, and 21, you find the works of the flesh, which is idolatry, envyings, drunkenness, all sorts of, of wicked things. Uh, he says again there, those that do such things, that's their characteristic, they shall not in inherit the kingdom of God. Now let's read verse number 22 out loud together. Ready out loud? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So how are we going to interact with the public arena with the spirit of gentleness and meekness that God has just told us to in Ch on Titus chapter 3? The fruit of the Spirit. What's the fruit of the Spirit? It's when I wake up tomorrow morning and say, God, I don't have the power to engage this culture with your same attitude. I don't have the ability, and I need you to fill me. I need you to control me. I need you to control my lips, Psalm 19. Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. That's where a lot of the problem starts, right? What we say, set a watch there, Lord. I need you to control me. 
and fill me with your spirit so that I can have this fruit. Now, these are not just different. I want the fruit. I want meekness today. No, when the spirit's in control in our lives, it is the fruit. All of it, love, joy, peace, will all be there. And so where's the answer? To Titus chapter number three, it's you and me being filled with the Holy Spirit tonight and tomorrow as we engage this this world. They need spirit-filled believers. You all believe that this, on this night? Would you, would you pray with me? I'm going to pray because I need that. I need that very bad. And so let's pray right now and uh, ask the Lord to help us. Father, would you guide during this invitation time? I, I pray the hearts of your people would just respond to you uh, so that we might bless and encourage and lead many to Christ even this week in Jesus' name. Would you find a place to pray in this auditorium? Come to the altar right now and let's, let's pray. Let's ask God to help us. Lord, I need that spirit, but I'm first submitting myself to you. I want to be filled with your Holy Spirit. I want to be filled. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, meekness, that strength under control. I'm not going to crush them. I'm not going to be hostile. Lord, would you fill me with your Spirit? Lord, would you forgive me for being angry at them even though I once did the very same things they are doing. Our Father, we do ask for your help, and we pray that you would make us to be effective for your glory's sake, that we would be that living, breathing, visible representation of Jesus Christ in every part of the community that you will lead us to this week. Uh, Lord, in our, in our daily lives, in the places that we go deliberately, uh, would you help us to be that in our homes? Lord, help us um, to be that, that representation of Christ. Lord, we need your spirit to fill us. Thank you for your church. Thank you for the heart of this church. And the Lord, help us to continue to grow in you. And we thank you for what you'll do in this week. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, they say it's easier to catch flies with what? Rather than... Than what? Than vinegar right? There's a good illustration. The sweet spirit, right? And may we, may we be honey to this world that is hurting, not vinegar. Um, and if the, the gospel offends and it will, that's one thing. But may we not, may our spirit not. And so um, I think the Lord had this for us as we engage in these days. So may God help us
Uh, as we leave tonight, uh, we are preparing for the 18th, the, uh, the Adventure Kids Club closing program, and or awards program, I should say, and we're looking forward to that. Uh, the kids have worked hard. You'd be amazed at how much uh, these young ones are doing on a week-to-week -week basis, and God's changing their hearts through Scripture. It's really neat to see. Um, they're going to be awarded here on in the Wednesday evening service, and so they, for the first time, have put on uh, a patch goes to the jungle, and so this is going to be a jungle next Sunday. They asked me if they could uh, they could set up in here, so this is going to become a jungle. Be kind of feeling like we're going to VBS a little bit early, so this is going to change on uh, this coming Sunday. But we could really use a couple of guys to help get down uh, this amazingly sturdy um, half wall here. And uh, you guys who have moved it understand that. But that would help us. And then there's some trees down in the fellowship hall um, that that could help. So who's who's ordering this? You or Rebecca? Okay, Rebecca has been named. And all in favor? No. Um, so anyway, those, uh, we'll, I'll, we'll guide up here, but if, if, if you could see Rebecca for what needs to come up this way from the fellowship hall, if you're able to, I know some of you might have to scoot, that's fine, um, but thank you for your help, and please be praying for that. Our heart is really to see um, parents out for that night, we'll preach the gospel um, as well, but would you just be praying for the 18th and that that would be a special time and continue to pray for Adventure Camp. Please grab a sign, please. And uh, if you think you can put out two, that would be great. Uh, do that, and, uh, and that would be a blessing. Grab Adventure Camp flyers, and that would be awesome. Let's continue to watch the bulletin for any other announcements uh, that, are, that are there and, and to stay up with those in there, yes. Oh, there's food. There you go. If you stay and help, there's nachos, all right? And so uh, that's a wonderful thing. Uh, food and fellowship. Well, God bless you. Have a wonderful week. If you're going to help out with the wall, come on up here and we'll give some instructions. And uh, ladies or whoever's helping out, otherwise go see Miss Rebecca. All right. Glory,